Do you ever not do something in the morning or don't want to do something in the morning because you're afraid you're going to have to take your morning shit while you're doing the activity? Because that just happened to me. I went on a lovely, much needed, rainy morning walk down by the river. The water was flowing. The smells were swampy and the noises were calming and peaceful but there's this feeling just you know a gut little instinct perhaps from my intestines <laughs> feeling like oh my gosh if I have to drop a number two where's that gonna happen and I like look in the forest and I like walk past a porta potty and like let's be honest I would a hundred percent rather take my morning doo-doo in the forest than a porta potty the porta potty ugh, I don't even want to talk about it the porta potty near my house. There's this like beautiful park near my house. There's a river and a ravine and it's like lovely nature esque. But the porta potty is not nice at all. But good news, I did not have to use either. Made it home in time. It's all good. But seriously, some things really prevent me from exploring them in the morning. That didn't make sense. Some things I really don't want to do in the morning because I am prevented by it because of my morning. That was weird. That just got weird. Things just got weird. But you might relate. I don't like to go to the gym in the morning because I don't want to have to go in the gym bathroom. If, I have, if I'm going to the gym gym, I'll go midday, afternoon, evening, whatever. But evenings are so busy. I'd rather just work out in my home because then if I need to go, I can go in peace. And even if, you know, I used to work 8 a.m. shifts. I used to wake up at 6, make sure I left my house by 7 because I had an hour commute to go all the way downtown to work at my reception job. And I would have to start by 8. And sometimes I couldn't even poo before I left the house and I'd have to go at work. So if you feel that, I I am here with you spiritually. I am sorry. It is difficult and it's going to be okay. When your body has to go, your body has to go. There's two types of people, people who poo at home and only at home and people who are able to poo anywhere. I have kind of gone between the two throughout my life and I'm really becoming a homebody pooer. But if I have to go elsewhere, elsewhere, I will. But that's not what today's episode is about. That was our quick little poo talk segment of today, just to kind of get us in the mood for the episode. <laughs> but today I actually have a guest on, which I am so excited about. Tara is a senior associate at an investment bank, but she is also an avid travel and female entrepreneur. She spends half her time in Canada and half her time in Mexico. Doesn't that sound like a dream? Of course, the time she spends in Mexico is in the winter and I am obsessed with this episode because we talk a lot about how to create the life of your dreams financially which is like such a gap in the conversations we have about wanting to create our dream life wanting to live in alignment with who we are is the money piece and I feel like we all have really limiting beliefs on I'm never gonna be able to afford a house or I'm never gonna be able to buy a property alone I'm gonna have to be married in 35 everything is so expensive and in this episode Tara really helps us work through our guilty money mindset the societal narratives and pressures about how we're supposed to be living financially and how to break away from that we talk about the difference between investing and saving she literally takes us through an investment calculator to see how much more money you would make if you put it your money into an investment account versus a savings account. It is so helpful. She gives such fucking tangible advice. And Tara is a bad fucking bitch. She has bought four properties. And this is literally between the ages of 24 and 32. And we start off the episode by talking about how she invested her student loans. This girl knows what the fuck is up in the finance world. And she also does one-on-one -on -one finance coaching work, group stuff. Um, and in the episode, she talks about, you know, this is what I talk to my students about. And that's who she's talking about. Her students, her clients, those are the people she works with one-on-one -on -one to talk about all this financial money stuff. But this is such a fucking great episode to welcome you into the world of like financial awareness, financial planning and investing, which all sounds really fucking scary. And Tara breaks it down in a way that's actually not scary and it's really fucking empowering. So I hope this episode lights a fire under your ass and it really makes you excited to gain some more awareness because 
As Tara talks about in this episode, money is about exchanging energy and money helps us live the life of our dreams. And so becoming aware of our financial situation is an empowering thing. Make sure you're following me on Instagram and TikTok at human to human pod. And if you think you have a friend in your life or someone that could really benefit from this episode, please send it to them. We all need more knowledge on this topic and it really helps normalize that we're not stupid and we're not bad at math. Um, This is something that takes some learning and some time and And I'm really glad Tara came on to open up the conversation about this. What you do is really interesting because you still work in the corporate finance world, but you also travel. You're in Mexico right now. You own multiple properties. Could you tell us a little bit about um, where you are today and how you got here? Yeah. And when you say that, it sounds like I was, you know, I I heard that about somebody else. I'm like, oh, it was probably passed down from her family or like she probably has family in Mexico and like that couldn't be further from the truth. And that's why I can sit here in my thirties now and be proud because that's what I try and teach people that I didn't come from money. I still help my mother out with understanding finance. That's what I went to school for. So I do work in the corporate world. I work um, at an investment bank in Toronto and it sounds like scary, whatever, but (laughs) it is sometimes when I'm there, but it's been almost seven years now and pandemic happened. Everybody had to work remotely. My boyfriend golfs for a living. So he has to inherently be somewhere warm to train in the winter. And we just both thought Mexico and he thought I was crazy for being like, let's move there. Come on. You know, normally it's Florida, but um, I had spent a lot of time down here before. And so now every year we spend the winter months in Mexico. I do work remotely for the bank and then I'm going back to Toronto in the summer. I'll go to the office. Um, But I've just kind of created this makeshift life. And like, thankfully for me, I know this is something strange to say, but the pandemic gave me a lot of gifts when it kind of took from a lot of other people. I was thinking that because I was reflecting and was like, you can work a finance corporate job remotely in Mexico. That's not the norm, but the pandemic, of course, made that accessible for people to just, you work from wherever. Yeah. And at first I won't lie to people. There was like a learning curve and it was, I was getting 6 a.m. messages and 6 p.m. messages and People weren't used to me not being there. Conversations in finance, they're like, if you're in the room, you're in the deal. If you're out of the room, you're out of the deal. And everybody was out of the room in the pandemic. So it didn't single me out. And my team, I'm very lucky to have a close-knit team who trusted that I would still get the work done. And during the pandemic, they had to trust everyone was going to get the work done. So it just created that gap for me to like really be opportunistic and say, okay, let's try this. If it doesn't work out, we can talk about it and make a change. If it does, this is something that I'd like to do. And it's kind of non-negotiable because pandemic, I couldn't travel with my partner, my boyfriend back and forth anymore. So I'm not going to see him for months on end. Are we both going to have to quarantine? I can't go to the office if I'm quarantining. So it came to a point where like, do I choose this relationship and this career? Yes, I want both. And I just miraculously now have made it work. And I'm so grateful that it does work. (laughs) Yeah, that's amazing. And so you have been able to get here from both your corporate job, as well as investing when you were a student with your student loans. Can you tell me about that risk that you took and how you kind of decided to take that leap and dealt with people around you saying you're crazy? and, And how could you do this? Yeah, I've got the you're crazy more often than not in my life. And now actually when people say you're crazy when I'm making a choice, I'm like the right one. It must be the right one. Because (laughs) since I was 18, I've gotten the like, Tara, you're nuts. Why are you moving overseas? What are you doing with your money? Why are you buying a place when like you should be renting? So yeah, you're, you're right. Also my student loans. And that's something I don't, I think that would be a cool tagline and story because it was true. And I didn't actually use those. I I use my OSAP. If you're from Canada, you know the OSAP is your student loans. I invested them into TD Bank GIC, which are very safe. And now I would be like, Tara, that was stupid. You were 18. You should have been more risky. 
but I put them in, I think a two or three year GIC. GICs guarantee you return back and you still make money. So I'm like, oh, what's the worst? I just pay it back and I use the interest. I started to play a little bit more as I went through university with my student loans and I used them to travel. I went on a trip with my mom to Mexico, actually the other side of Mexico. I went to Bermuda, the Cayman Islands. So back then I didn't take my investments and turn them into assets like I do now, but I paid my OSAP back and then I used whatever was left over that I made an interest to travel back then. So, and I was working through university, so I didn't actually need the OSAP at the time. I was like working full time um, at a restaurant. So I just have always really looked at things and problems in life. Like there are gray areas and to be creative with what works for you is what I led for myself. And that's why like, okay, there's a pandemic. My boyfriend golfs for a living. How can we plug in and be creative to make this fruitful and profitable for all of us where everybody wins. And that's what I do with my students. And that's what I do with my life. And I'm just really lucky that, that I am able to shift my mind in a way that everything's a silver lining. You can monetize anything. Um, and I can help other people, including my family to see these options. Mm -hmm. And there's so many like societal expectations put on us or these myths that like you can't buy a property alone or in Toronto, you're never going to be able to afford a house and investing really made some of that possible for you. Can you describe how you've been able to like work through those, those narratives and those pressures and find those alternate routes? Yeah. So I think that it's not just investing that has done that for me. I think that understanding early that there are options with money, whether it's like a great savings plan or splitting your investments or paying debt, investing at the same time. I teach my students and people, and I talk about this a lot, that there should be a well-rounded conversation when it comes with money. It's not just I'm going to buy a house, so I'm going to sacrifice my life for five years to purchase a home. I want to go to Europe, so I'm going to not go out with my girlfriends for two weeks so I can go to Europe. I think that all of that sacrifice can be cut out, and I think that's kind of a bullshit way of planning your financial roadmap because what, whatever your goals are, we can work backwards, but it doesn't mean that's the only thing that you have to do. So when it came to me purchasing my house, and I have the first one, I had a co-signer because I was very young. I was 24, but I paid for it myself. And everybody told me I was crazy. I had just moved back from Australia. I was living in Australia and I was going to rent and the opportunity came to buy. I, my, I got a pre-approval and I needed a co-signer, but I bought at 24 when I had just come home, didn't even have a job yet. <laughs> I don't know how that happened. And then since then, I have bought two properties on my own, no co-signer, nothing funny about it. I have had a job since then. So that's three properties from 24 to 32. I have since only sold one, the other two I'm sitting on. But point being, like, you can do that. It's not a weird thing. Lenders told me no. My family told me no. A lot of people said, don't do that. Like, it's not the right time or what if, what if, what if? No, like history says real estate is growing in Toronto in the GTA. If I can afford it, I'm pre-approved and the offer is there, I'm going to take it. Like I can always find a tenant to pay the rent should I not be able to in a place like Toronto. So again, it's just what creative strategy can I now, instead of going on vacation, well, I'm in Mexico, but instead of, <laughs> using my investments for just pleasure now and vacation, I turn them into assets like home, my Airbnbs, et cetera, because I want passive income. And that comes from real estate. That comes from setting yourself up young and early so that I can chill now. I'm in my early 30s, living in Mexico half a year with several properties, nobody to answer to. And that's what I dreamed of in my 20s. So mm. it's possible. Mm -hmm. I'm sitting here and it's like 
cool to hear this story. And for me as a 22 year old, I'm like, oh my God, obviously I want this. And it's overwhelming at first and it feels very daunting. So I'm curious advice you have on where to start and where to work through those fears that come in the beginning stages. Yeah, I was getting ready for my morning and my boyfriend's here and he's like, oh, he's gone now. But he's like, oh, you're doing a podcast today. And I'm like, yeah. And Jess is only 22. So like, this is great because I can not mold, but you know, if I had at 22, someone like me to tell me, this is what I've done. Like you have books. Okay. You have social media, you have people, but not one-on-one often. And often they're just like, I know, because I read that these are things to do. They haven't done it. So for me to talk to you, and I often think that I should go and talk to universities or high school because it is a, you have an opportunity in your twenties to set yourself up for the rest of your life. And that doesn't mean I didn't drink. I didn't party. I traveled (laughs) all of those things that you shouldn't do. I actually got married and divorced within 11 months. Like, yeah, I lived my twenties and had the best time. I have no regrets. In the meantime, while I was doing that, I knew what I was doing with my money, which made a difference, which I learned. And everything else kind of was easy and comfortable to do because I knew I had a plan in place. So when you get the opportunity to understand that, hey, putting $100, $200 into an investment account, not a savings account, a month, you're going to be fine in 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, you start to live life a little differently because you know you're good and you know that you're taking care of that. It doesn't depend on somebody else, a man, a parent, a this. You know the numbers, Well, I trust the numbers. And when I go and look historically, I teach people and I show them the numbers with history. It's not just, oh, Tara said, this is what's going to happen. Or Tara said, this is what should happen. This is what has happened since the stock markets have opened in the 1920s, 19, whatever. So it's not me telling you, it's the numbers telling you. And I trust the numbers as someone in finance. So I think there's a lot of things people can do out there to realize, hey, I have all the time in the world to do this. But if I do this for myself now, I can chill for like a lot of my life. It doesn't have to be work until 60 and then have fun. Mm hmm. Wow. It's, it's, it's so cool to hear someone say this stuff because we're not taught it in school. We're not, you know, we're basically given down a money mindset from who raised us. And we're told by society and the economy and how expensive buying a home is that this isn't possible. You're not going to be able to do it till you're in your thirties. You're not going to be able to do it till you get married. And it feels empowering to be able to hear that that's not the case. And I love on human to human talking about like going against the grain and debunking some of those societal pressures. It it gets me going of like, okay, now I need to learn. Now I need to like figure out what these things mean and figure out my wiggle room and what I can invest in. Um, And can you describe actually the difference between investing and saving those two accounts? Yeah. So I was like you. And I remember 23, I think exactly 23, driving up to Muskoka with friends in the car. I had my investing for dummies book (laughs) and I was picking, I was literally in the front seat of a car, my feet up with my investing for dummies book. And I was true story was picking my first stocks to invest in. And I was terrified. And at like 10 years later, I still own the same shares because they were good choices. So again, I was like you, like, it's my time to educate myself. I need to understand. I saw people get richer. I saw, I came from a family that did struggle and uh, wasn't, didn't have everything that everybody else had. We were middle class and I would see other people have everything. And I just wanted to know how do they do it? What do they do for a living? Like, like this seems as if anybody can do this. So how can I, and I was a sponge like you. So I learned very early that the difference between saving and investing is the numbers astronomical. Okay. And if anybody listens to this and wants to reach out to me, I will literally send you a calculator, which we can link probably where you can plug in with $0. Okay. $0 to start a monthly amount that you want to invest, not save. We can put an interest rate that is very nominal, like 10% a year, which is average, 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 not amazing. And you'll see the difference between saving and investing 
is hundreds of thousands of dollars, hundreds of thousands. In most cases, over a million plus dollars if you're in your 20s and you're starting with two or $300 a month and people will say to me, they can't afford it. And I get that if you truly can't afford it, but if you can find 20, 50, 75, 100 bucks to start at 22, 23, 24. Okay, you're 25 now. You can do 150 a month, like non-negotiable. And you do that for 10, 15, 20, 25 years. You don't have to worry. You will be a millionaire. You will be wealthy. This doesn't include your property. This doesn't include your partner. This doesn't include any savings that you do have. Pay it like a phone bill for your life and you're set. Like we're talking millions and I'll, I'll link the calculator for you so people can play with the number. And when I say millions, people are like, okay, Tara, no, no, no. If compound interest means that when you invest enough or save enough that it's like $100,000 and you're making 10% a year on that 100,000, it's gonna keep growing and get bigger and bigger and bigger. So by the time you are 40, 50, 60, you don't have to invest or save anything. Live your best mm -hmm. life. You, know? you mm -hmm. can actually take your foot off the gas the older you get rather than what we're taught is, okay, you're 40, think about retirement now. No, think about it like passively when you're in your 20s so that you're going to be like 800 steps ahead of everybody when they're 40. Wow. Yeah. I will. And you do one-on-one -on -one work with people, um, which is incredible to be able to kind of freely ask these questions and get your insight on all of this. And I want to discuss the money blocks that you find really come up for people because you take such a practical approach to this. And I'm obsessed with it because the amount of stuff we see on social media about just like, you know, there's some manifestation stuff where I'm like, yes, I believe in it. But just sitting here and being like, I'm going to attract $5 this week, I'm going to attract this. It's like, great, but we're also not having this be founded on knowledge that comes with the numbers because everybody's like, and I'm sure you hear this, I'm bad with math. I'm bad with math. I struggled with math in school. What do you say to that? So I struggled with math in school in university as well. And it's funny that now I work in finance and I deal with numbers all day because what you learn in finance and math, like personal finance doesn't have anything to do with math as far as I'm concerned. It has to do with setting your goals. What do we want? That question for some people dumbfounds them like they can't even get through question one and that's a block they limit themselves in their belief system to be able to want or desire anything so that first question what do we want what are our goals like you have to crack through that first of all second question is okay when do we want this like what is our timeline again like not math involved but like is it zero to three years three to five years ten years plus when do we want that? Again, some people are blocked that they don't know. They're not thinking about anything past today because they're scared that it's not coming. So scarcity, you have to get through that. And then there's, okay, how do we get there? And this is the fun part because understanding that, yes, you can get there. It's probably relatively very easy to get there if we can work backwards and you can identify what do I want? When do I want it? And yeah, I'm half woo-woo because you do have to know what you want. If you're not asking for it, you shall not receive it, you know, so <laughs> ask and you shall receive. So the, the spiritual part of me says like, you must dream bigger and ask for more and be prepared to receive it. And when the answer, you know, yes, I can receive that. Then we have to go into the logistics of how are we going to get it? And yes, I believe that you can manifest things and they show up, but a new home really isn't going to show up at your doorstep unless you have a realtor, right? So there, there are kind of logistics that go hand in hand with the woo woo side of things. And I think that understanding that just one of those money blocks that you have, most people have like three to four, there are like 12 common blocks, most people have three to four. And just one of those can be limiting enough that you are stuck in this low vibration of I don't deserve anything. I don't deserve to grow. I'll never get it. It'll never come. Like that mindset doesn't exist for me. I can have anything I want and it's not arrogant. It's just, I can have anything I want within reason. You know, I can do anything I want within reason. Why can't I like, tell me why I can't. And having that attitude and mindset 
is like, maybe it's not going to be today. I can do that. Or tomorrow I can do that. But if that's what I want, I'm going to get it. Mm -hmm. And I think understanding and really trusting that to be true is how you can start to step out of insecure relationship with money. Also understanding and educating yourself. The number one thing I tell people is you don't have to be good at math. You don't have to even know what you want yet, but understanding the numbers and knowing that you're going to be okay allows you to sleep at night, allows you to dream for things you want. And just knowing like, if I put this $200, $300 away a month from 22 to 52, I'm going to have a million dollars. I actually just pulled up the calculator here. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to go through it? Yes, absolutely. So we're going to do $0 to start with. And we're going to do $300 a month. Okay, so 150 by weekly. I know that people are like, Tara, you're pushing it, but let's just say that's average, okay? Over 35 years. So if you're 30, if you're 22, what's that gonna put you? 57, right? Yeah. Let's see, I'm bad at math. <laughs> I have an interest rate here of 12% because markets average between 7 to 12% a year. Okay, I'm shocked with this number because I haven't done this calculation in a while. So we're going to recap. Initial investment is zero. This is the first time I've done this on a podcast, by the way. I love this. this. Initial investment is zero. $300 a month. Interest rate is 12%. And I can show people where to find something that makes you 12% a year with your bank. I can find that for you. Interest is going to be compounded annually because that's how we compound interest. So if you guys are doing this calculator at home, do annually. 35 years to grow. So Jess wants to be 57, not worry about anything. Calculation is $1.6 million. Wow. One, over $1.6 million. And when I do the math myself and I tell you what you would have saved in a savings account, it's $126,000. So $300 a month times 12, 3,600 a year times 35 years. $126,000 would be in a savings account. If you put it in an investment that can make you 12% a year, which is conservative, I wish I could show my screen to the podcast, $1,637,709. So $1.6 million, okay? And you're with TD Bank, I know that, Jess. So like I could go in today and be like, I can find a fund that averages you 12% a year, we're already up 7% this year in the stock market. Literally, you don't have to do anything. You don't have to do anything. If you put money in this one fund for 35 years and you're like, I'm going to chill now. 300 bucks a month is what I contribute. $1.6 million, you know? So wow. just, it's hard for me to sit and be like, no, I'm not going to do that anymore. Or like, yeah. And I'm so glad you're like, let me tell people this stuff. And I'm so glad you reached out to be like, please let me come on your podcast. Because I think a lot of my audience is around my age and just having such big dreams. We're big dreamers here and don't know how to make it happen. And this is such fantastic, tangible advice on this is possible. It starts with acknowledging, okay, there's a lot of stuff I don't know. That means there's a lot of stuff to learn and you can go through the process of slowly learning it and getting yourself out of that, you know, chaotic, negative guilt, money mindset. Yeah. I think I'm excited about young people uh, younger than me, because when I was in my twenties and I'm not old, but I didn't even have the, when I was doing my OSAP and buying my first place, I was 24 because people told me I was crazy still back then. I didn't have the confidence then to know, Tara, what you're doing is right. I still went with my gut. I still followed what I wanted to do. It worked out for me. But now because I've repeated that process a few times, and now that I'm looking to purchase place number four, which will be third place on my own that I own by myself, and I'm looking to do that pre-approval process in the next six months, if I hadn't done that before from 22, 23, 24 years old, I would still hear and listen to people call me, I'm crazy. Now they still are like, oh, she's a little nuts, but it's less, less about hearing the noise now. And I'm lucky that I didn't listen to society and everybody because a lot of people, even brokers, when I was 27, I bought my, my second property, which was my first solo on my own. It was a condo that I lived in in Toronto and it was listed for like over half a million dollars. And I was renting it and I'm like, oh, I'm never gonna get this. And a lot of lenders told me, 
No, they wouldn't give me a mortgage. But a few of them told me yes. And then when I got one yes, I could kind of pit them against each other and play the game a little bit. So again, if people hear this and they are self-employed or young or want to talk about, I'm happy to connect people with the lenders that I know. It might not be Scotiabank or TD Bank that your mortgage is with, but you'll get a mortgage, hopefully. And mm -hmm. the people that said no to you, there's other people that will say yes. And that was a, a big lesson for me because two years later, I bought a second property. I bought another home. And now three years later than that, I'm going to buy my third property by myself. If I had listened to the no that someone told me at 27 or 24, mm -hmm. then I still probably wouldn't own property. And now I'm about to have three. And like, I, I don't even know many people that have marriages that are like, I own two places or three places. I'm about to be a one woman show with three properties. And like, you know, there's nobody that I give credit to that, honestly, and this does sound arrogant, but other than myself, because a lot of us listen to those voices that say no, or say it's not the right time for our parents. Like my mom has never owned more than one property and she does that with a partner, you know? So not mm -hmm. to say I'm better or worse or whatever, but these are options that are there for every woman, every man, mm -hmm. every person, not just Tara because she came from money because I didn't, you know? So mm -hmm. I think it's very important to teach people, don't listen to the no's all the time. Don't listen to the you're crazies all the time. Know what's right for you. Trust your gut and like be confident in your financial plan. And if you're not, seek help with someone you trust who can educate you so that you do, you know, find that confidence. Yeah, a hundred percent. I wanted to ask as well, because there's a lot of noise about the risks involved with investing. And can you describe what those risks are and what we should know about that? Yeah. So there's a lot of, of risk involved when it comes to investing and the spectrum goes from like very low risk, like I talk about GICs and bonds that I invested in, um, where you can choose ones where you get your principal back. So I put $2,000 in, I'm going to be guaranteed my $2,000 back, and it's going to make some interest. Likely those ones won't make you a lot of interest, like 10% a year. But through your bank, there are always options and on the stock market, but you don't have to get crazy. That's why I... I told you, Jess, and I tell people, when I just went through that calculator with you, that's not you having to go and look up and read books and go on stock charts. And unless you want to, that's fun, but you don't have to. You can go through your bank. You can work with somebody to find you baskets of funds that are managed for you. They're already managed for you. I am not talking about robo-advising, okay? I am actually very, I stand against Robo what's, advising. What's robo advising? Like a well simple. Okay. Where they and they do a great job marketing. And please don't sue me, well simple. I think your platform does a good job. But um, I personally don't love when you give money to a platform and they decide where it goes for you. And mutual funds do that, and other places like TD Bank do that. But you still have with your home bank you still have autonomy over what you're choosing to invest in. Something like those robo accounts, like a wealth simple or an E-Trade or something where you just put money in and they invest it for you. You're investing in things that you might not want to be. And I have had clients come to me and say, hey, I'm with wealth simple or this robo account and I'm making 2% this year while everyone else is making 28%. While you'd never know what the, like whose best interest is it, that they're put placing your money. So robo advising is not something that I love. And I'm happy to discuss that with anybody that wants to, but going through your home bank and finding something that works with your risk tolerance that, you know, is suitable for you is part of our job as people in the financial field to make sure we, we know what's suitable for you. And disclaimer, full disclaimer, this isn't a personal finance you know, suggestion or advice, like not financial advice, hashtag, but, <laughs> but you want to make sure that you're not investing money you need. Like my cousin messaged me last week, she's your age. And she said, I have some money sitting in my savings account, but I need it for a first and last payment in three or four months. So I said, okay, so don't invest it. You know, anything yeah. you need in like a short term, zero to six months, six, whatever, 
is not meant to be invested. I'm looking to purchase my home that I talked about. So that money right now for me, my home purchase, because that's gonna happen soon for me, I'm not investing it. It would probably go up with this year's landscape, but I still, if you don't invest money, you need. It's a long-term plan and the long-term plan always wins. Mm. Wow. This is so I good. I confuse you. I feel like I'm just confusing everybody. No, else. no, no, you're not. You're, okay. you're like, I, you're making me think, which I love because it makes me think, okay, that means we have to look at our finances and that means we have to look at what we need. And that means we have to look at how much we spend per month and all of that stuff. Yeah. I think a lot of us get very scared about doing is right. there's this weird blind, like ignorance of like, I'm not going to look, I'm just going to pay my credit card bill, you know, instead of being like, okay, well, I like going out this many times a week. Or, and so I'm, that's averaging this much I'm spending per month. Um, and it's interesting when you do look at those numbers of how much you spend and then you're like, okay, is this good or is it bad? But I don't think we necessarily have to like label good or bad. Yeah, you're onto something. I was just going to say there's power in knowing what's happening with your finances. If you spend $2,000 a month going to the bar, girl, you have the best time. Yeah. You know, this is what I work through with. Like I have an investing program too, and I have a whole module about budgeting. And I tell people like, give yourself grace, budgeting and having a budget is not to cut yourself out of your own life. It's to understand where your money's going, what you're doing with it and make sure you're aligned with that. Like we did my, my boyfriend's taxes a few weeks ago and we were looking through his statements to like pull taxes and pull whatever. And he has been paying for good life, Jim, the whole time we've been living in Mexico. And it's like, it's only 70 bucks a month or something, but you know, you're, you're paying for good life. But, so make sure it aligns with you. Does that align with you? Well, we're not in the country. Probably not. You know, <laughs> it's not, it's not meant to bully you or be a tool to discourage you in like, oh, this is what I do. There's no guilt or shame about what you spend. But if you look at that and you're like, oh, I'm going and I'm spending too much, that doesn't align with you. So you're adjusting it for you because you're choosing to, you're not adjusting it because- it somebody tells you to, I have goosebumps, but like, that's the truth, you know? Yeah. I, and that hits home seriously, because that's what I talk about so much is living a life that's aligned with you. And that means with your money, we don't, mm -hmm. I, and I don't think about it like that. And I love that. And I love we're having these conversations because it helps my brain expand that money is used to live a life that is aligned with you. So for me, an example is like, if I'm going to a bar, I recently have stopped partying as much and stopped drinking as much. And it's just felt better for me, um, like physically, emotionally, whatever. And so if I look at my credit card bill and I'm like, oh, I spent a hundred dollars at a bar on shots, I'm going to be like, I'm not, I'm going to feel icky about that. But for someone else, it might be like, that's the time I have my best freaking nights out. I have the best time with my girls, whatever. And so it, it's it's just interesting when you think about all the people in your life too. I'm like, my boyfriend spends money on completely different things than I do because he prioritizes different things that are like his creative passions or his endeavors or whatever. And like using that as a tool to create a life that we love is so much fucking better than coming from a place of guilt and like, oh, why did I spend hundred dollars on that new pair of jeans and it's like well I was dying for a new pair of jeans because mine don't fit me anymore and now I get to wear those jeans all the time and they make me feel amazing right right there's a balance between understanding that it's excess you know and and understanding that your money is your energy especially I tell people who don't love their job or where the money's coming from I work with them on a gratitude practice because that's giving them energy to fuel something else so whether or not it's their forever job or forever something, the money that's coming from it, that you're earning from it, you don't want to go there and like disrespect that money and that earnings because it's coming to you and you are placing it places. So that's not going to be forever if you're unhappy at work, but the energy, which is money that's coming to you, you get the control out of to choose what you do with it. If you want to put it in that investment account we talked about and turn it into $1.6 million, girl, you do that. And you hate that job, but that's what it gave you. You know, like, for example, I am not a big shopper or spender because I travel a lot. So I can't really bring anything with me. But I was having like, you know what? I never go out. I never shop or do I go out, but I never shop. And 
I was down here in Mexico on Fifth Avenue shopping and I went and I tried on pants and I bought them and then I left. I went to another store and I bought, and then I tried on the pants again that I had just purchased in a second shop. And I'm like, I hate these. They don't fit me properly. They don't make me feel good. I just wanted to buy something. And I'm not normally like that. So this was like a strange, Tara, be like everybody else moment for me. And then I went back to the store and I returned the freaking pants because you know what? I didn't, I didn't really want them. They didn't align with me. I was just thinking it might make me feel good to have something new to wear and it didn't and it doesn't. So, you know, maybe that's not my thing, but then when I buy a flight and I'm like, do you want to upgrade? You know, maybe that's where I want my money to go. So my point is it doesn't have to look the same as somebody else. I, I was in my own trap in my thirties going, being like everyone else shops and buy stuff. Like maybe I'll feel good and I'll feel fresh and go. I wasn't, I didn't. So I returned it because I know better, even if it was 50, $60, I'm not going to keep those. Like, what am I going to do with those? Mm -hmm. So I just, my, my point all the time is when I say the woo woo stuff and the spiritual side of me is like, make sure that you are aligned with these choices financially because they impact your thought process and your mentality and your attitude and your gratitude. And if you focus more on the positives that money brings to you through your job or through your whatever, and you are mindful when you're placing that energy elsewhere, it's like the same as coaching. If you're going to hire me as a coach, some people I go through their finances and I'm like, you can't afford to hire me. Like, why did you book the session in my head? And they know that. But then if they save $200, $300, or they now can make $1.6 million, like, yes, they can afford it, you know? So it's all about aligning and investing in yourself and investing in assets and investing in things that make you feel good rather than just like the slurge guilt mindset. Yeah, yeah. Like I just, some I, it's amazing. I love doing interviews when I like, when, when I guess, finishes the sentence and I'm like yep I have nothing else to add like that was perfect like it's just it's so empowering and it's changing my mindset about money because it's coming from a place of 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 joy and energy and I get that like the way you described exchanging money is like exchanging energy makes sense to me and I struggle sometimes with the, the people I see talk about it because it feels so woo woo but this is in a place of um helping you build the life you want to live and doing it in a way that comes from it, you know, an empowered place. And even about the return story you just told, like I felt, oh, would I have felt guilty in that? Would I have, would I have, you know, beaten myself up for buying those pants, even though I'm about to go return them? But it's like, it doesn't have to hold that much weight. It can be like, oh, I made this purchase. I still am able to return it. Perfect. And then you walk away feeling more relieved from that experience. Yeah. And it's funny because I didn't, you know, plan to, oh, that's great part of this podcast. But that was something that happened to me recently. And even someone who teaches about money mindset and has programs and courses and properties and whatever, I still go through the same processes that every other person goes through. And it's the same relating back to investing. If you make an investment and it's not doing well, you think you've done something wrong or you've made the wrong choice or you get that guilty mindset if you see anything fluctuate. And it doesn't happen when, when your money's growing, you know, you're like, wow, I did. So it's strange to me that money can take you and your guts and your inside and like drag you through it like that when really like we do that to ourselves. So I'm working on it still as someone who has done this for a decade plus now. And the truth is always in investments that like the longer you have, the more guarantee that you're going to get. And there's something I share with my students where it's every single sector in the stock market, there's 11 of them, every single sector in three years, five year, 10 year return, there's a chart that tells you what's going on with each sector. I share this with them actually once a month in my mailing list, and you can join my mailing list, it's free, but my students specifically get this chart once a month because it reminds you that no matter what's happening with the markets right now, with your money right now, with your investments right now, with your life in the economy, looking at three-year, five-year, 10-year and seeing positive returns across the board, 100% across any stock, any sector of the stock market, the full stock market is a positive return. 
So it's like, what can guarantee you more than that? Seeing if I wait three, five or 10 years, no matter where I chose is not the wrong place. Okay. And also disclaimer, I'm not talking like a meme stock or something off the handle, but any of these funds or through your bank or whatever, sector-based funds, whatever, we can talk about that a million different times. But my point is that if you have the time, which young people do have the time, myself included, to wait out the economy and you're not paying attention and feeling guilty about, oh, I lost $10 in the stock market today. Who the fuck cares? You're going to make hundreds of thousands in 25 years. Like, seriously, my brother used to message me like, I'm down 10%. Yeah, so is the rest of the world. You know, you know what my 10% looks like? A lot more loss than yours, you know? So I have to remind myself and other people that when you look at the numbers, if you have time to sit there and be quiet and wait and do your job, which is just trusting the process and the numbers that you're guaranteed, you know, these results, I mean, nothing's guaranteed, but his, history says you're guaranteed these results in the end. So there's a lot of psychological shit that happens with money. All I try to do is help people day to day, month to month, year to year, short and long term, feeling confident and comfortable that your decisions are yours. Your money is in your control only. Nobody else can tell you what to do with it. You have the power to make or break your financial situation and own that. Whether you're choosing to self-sabotage and break the shit out of your finances, that's what you're doing right now. You know, it it's may a change. Choice. It's your choice and that's your power and your control. So is your spending. So is your purchasing. And, you know, I have to work on remembering that other people's spending and purchasing decisions aren't mine. So I have no judgment when it comes to that. And I really, I really make a point to make my students and clients feel like judgment free zone because we all do different things. But the whole point of me even coming on podcasts like this is to get conversations started and make people feel good and better about themselves and their financial situation rather than just them comparing, you know, online. Yeah. Well, amazing. I feel like that like tied everything in a beautiful bow, <laughs> but I still, I wanted to ask um, two things more specifics about investing. Um, when I went to invest in a tax-free savings account, um, I spoke with someone at TD and he said, you know, it's important with those investment accounts to set it and forget it, not stare at it every day and get yourself all, you know, crazy about it because it's going to fluctuate so much. Um, and I'm curious, one, how many different investments is it common to have? Or, you know, is it typical to start with one and grow more or just stick with that one and really continue? Is it a personal choice? And at what point do people commonly pull their money out? And when is a smart time to pull their money out, if ever? Okay, great question. So we start again with um, our goals as far as your last question of when do we pull the money out? Um, if your goal is, I want to buy a house in five years, we're going to look differently at your finances than if like, this is for retirement, I don't need to pay or pay attention to this. General rule is the longer that you have, if it is retirement money, the more risky you can be. You want to be more risk averse if you need the money in the next like one to two, two to three years. Um, so that question is, kind of up to what your goals are. And then again, we would work backwards. But if you have time, the more time you have, the higher risk you can take as far as investments. And again, I don't mean like individual mean stocks, meme stocks. I just mean on like the risk tolerance scale of like stocks instead of bonds. Um, your other question was, how many investments do okay. people typically make? Yeah. Yeah. So again, this question would come down to, I go through my, with my clients, a step-by-step -step process when we're in the beginning, like, okay, we haven't invested before we do that calculator, which I talked about, and then we go through a budget. So I send typically my clients a budget template. We go through this in first session. I'll send it to you, Jess, if you want it. And you just determine with that budget, again, nothing cutting or like a million paragraphs. It's just a breakdown whatever number you get at the bottom of your budget is what you have left over. We take that number and we determine how much of that number together or yourself, how much of that number you are willing to comfortably invest. I.e., I do not need this money. I don't care about this money. I'm not going to pay attention. If that number, what's left over is in the thousands, then we have more to work with. If it's in the hundreds or less, 
then we have less to work with. So that, that, that's your first step. Once you get that number, if you're looking at anything over a hundred dollars, I would say pick more than one investment. Because if you have $200 or 150, I would say put $75 in two or $100 in two. I would also say for people invest more often than not. Because for example, if I'm putting $200 in a month, I'm not putting $200 in at the end of the month. I'm going to do 100 on the 15th, 100 on the 30th. Because you want to be in the market as often as possible. If you, they just had a great month in the market and now we're at a low on the day that you're purchasing, you're only getting in on one day. So you want to take advantage and dabble as much like a sample size, right? You want to get in as much as you can. So if you're somebody who has a hundred dollars, I would say one to two funds max, 50 bucks to a hundred bucks a month with TD or whoever you're with, automate those payments into funds. If you have more than that, like three, 400, if it's like looking at $400 a month, you could pick three or four because you want to diversify. You don't want your investments to be the same. Again, when I work with students, I go and I look at the funds. Like let's say you're with TD. I pull up the funds, we go through them together and we make sure we're not duplicating because a lot of them are similar. And if you own Apple and every single one of them, maybe you want to switch to own a little more healthcare or real estate or whatever. So I work with people to make sure that we're not duplicating, but really with your bank and you are investing, there's not a wrong answer is what mm. I'm trying to tell people. Mm -hmm. If you pick one and it's like not the same one I would pick or you would pick, it's not the wrong one. It's still going to be a great fund that's properly managed that will get you likely to that million plus dollar mark. But diversify as much as you can without overdoing it. Again, like if you're with a hundred dollars, you're not going to put $25 in four different funds. That's not what I would do, but start with one. You can move to two. Remember guys, if you're listening and just that this can always change that amount you allocate can always change. If you want to add a fund, if you're like, I got a bonus, I want to put $3,000 in investments. Hey, Tara, should I pick one that I have or should I, diversify into another one you know that's an option that we talk about we'll see how your ones are performing and what you're invested in and make the decision based on that so i think step one open your tfsa investing account step two choose one or two funds that you're comfortable with determine that amount that you can auto invest and then really that's all you have to do you don't have to ever do anything again if you want you can change the amount but I hope that answers. Yeah, it does. Thank you so much. Oh yeah. my gosh, so helpful. Um, to close off, I would love to hear a piece of advice that you would give your younger self when you you were making these decisions um, in terms of uh, anywhere you want to go with it. But also I'm curious what you would say to the other people who called you crazy or say to yourself to get through it. Yeah, I think I would just trust yourself. Like trust yourself because- that's not, that's not the same as saying go with your gut or ignore the noise because sometimes when people are like, you're crazy, there may be some merit to that, but trust yourself because I always knew what was right for me. You have your best interest at heart always. Inherently, we look out for ourselves first and foremost, and I don't think that's a bad thing. So I think I would tell my younger self, trust yourself. Like, you know what's right, whether it's a relationship whether it's a financial decision, whether it's with family or friends, you know what's right and wrong for you. And really nobody else's opinion matters because when you get to your 30s, you can do what the fuck you want if you've trusted yourself <laughs> because you know that your decisions are good decisions. Yeah. So they'll always be good decisions if they're for you, authentically for you. So I think that's what I would tell my younger self. I tried to do that as often as I could. But there were times when I knew something didn't feel right and I still, you know, tried it on just to see. But I would tell my younger self, like, trust yourself. You know what you're doing and it's going to be great. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Cause with anything you, if you don't know something or you doubt yourself, then you pick up that knowledge and you learn it. You pick up a book, you look online, you reach out to someone you trust because it's great when you notice doubt 
And I've made that in terms of health decisions recently too. I've been like, oh, I am nervous to make this health change. And so I'm going to keep researching it and trusting when you have that doubt, listen to it. What do you need to learn to help feel more secure in your decisions? Right. Right. And I would tell my younger self, you know, like it's going to be fine if you just continue to trust what you know, because there's a reason why you get these intuitions and you get whatever it could be nothing, but explore it so that you at least make every decision knowing that this was my choice. I own this decision. And I would tell my younger self, we're going to have a hell of a next decade. So (laughs) wrap in. I love it. Thank you so much for coming on, Tara. Please tell everybody where they can find you, your website, your socials, all of that. So my name is Tara Marie Murphy. That's my name. And that's my socials and my website. So that's pretty easy to find me. Um, Instagram is probably the best way to get in touch with me because I do have a link there where you can email me, you can ask me questions. I'm grateful enough to have some teams that help me with social. So I am responsive on Instagram. Um, My website is there too. It has my course information. I have coaching promos come up. So if you ever want one-to-one support or you want to go through this with your bank or set it up, like typically guys, it just takes one time. And then you're set it and forget it, like they said, um, which was good advice. Yeah. But um, that's where you can find me. And I'm so grateful, Jess, that you had me. I love the opportunity to speak to women and younger women and people that were like me and are like me so that, um, you know, maybe money is not their area of expertise, but it's mine. So if I can teach even one thing or have a takeaway that someone can learn from, I feel like I've done my job, you know, as, yeah. as someone who wants to share. I love it. You have so much knowledge to share and like all of that came through in this episode and I'm so grateful. And I love that you have a team that was so persistent too, to be like, hello, following up. And I was like, who is this finance girl? I had it on my to-do list. I'm like, follow up with the finance girl. I got to find out like what's going on with this. Yeah, um, and yeah, I couldn't do that without you or without my team. Like this wouldn't exist. So yeah. Yeah. I'm, and I'm, I'm so glad we did this interview now because I'm done school and I just feel like there's so much less of this weight for me of, Oh, but I have to wait to finish this thing, which you don't, you don't have to wait to finish school or anything clearly to do this stuff. But, um, I'm so excited to learn more about all of this and you've really lit that fire in me. So thank you. Did you book an appointment with your bank yet? Because I certainly did. I can't even lie. I had a lot of, you know, procrastination, a little bit of resistance and fear of sounding stupid between the time when I recorded and edited. So in those couple weeks, I didn't yet book my appointment with my investment dude at TD Bank, who's going to help me really set myself up for financial success. But while I edited this episode, I was like, that's it. We have to do it while we're in the state of excitement. And Rachel Hollis talks about that always book that class or that race or that appointment when you're in the state and the state is a state of inspiration and excitement because you're just going to do it and then between now and when the appointment or whatever the thing is actually happens in between those periods of time you'll figure it out I booked my financial advising appointment for a week from now so I have a couple days to get my shit in order and know what I'm going to go in and talk to him about. And Tara luckily really helped me do that in this episode. And if you're interested in knowing more, check Tara out. All her stuff is linked in the show notes, as well as the investment calculator that she talked about, which is so, so helpful. Again, if you enjoyed this episode, please send it and share it with a friend. And I really encourage you to push yourself to look into investing more and just remember that We all have the fear. None of us are dumb. We all just are looking to learn new things and knowledge is fucking power. So if you're interested in kind of having more of a fire lit under your ass, I offer human to human coaching. You can find more details on my Instagram, my TikTok, um, my website that is coming very, very soon. Um, And make sure you DM me at human to human pod or email me human to human pod at gmail.com if you want to chat more about how you can create this dream life that's in alignment with who you are to set boundaries to listen to your body all that good stuff make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss a new episode that comes out every freaking monday and i really hope you learned something from this episode because i certainly fucking did <laughs> see you soon